All right. Well, let's take uh, questions from the audience. We've got about half an hour for you. I'm just going to go geographically from left to right, and I'll start over there with that gentleman. There are microphones. Please wait. Please be aware there are television cameras and the like, so identify yourself and, and please ask a question. Uh, thank you, Steve. Mark Jacobson from the German Marshall Fund, formerly of uh, NATO and ISAF headquarters in Kabul. Uh, Rajiv, you wrote uh, you know, a fantastic book, Imperial Life in the Emerald City, and you asked the question then, you know, how could we have done better? And my question to you is, is the criticism that the U.S. Embassy received in Kabul over the last several years warranted? Had they learned at all, institute, had the State Department and AID learned at all from the experience of Iraq? And, and where should we give them credit? And what do we really need to see changed as we approach uh, the next conflicts? You know, I, I, I think there were, there were, I don't think, I, I will say unequivocally, there were uh, an, an awful lot of, of brave, talented diplomats and reconstruction workers who were out there. Often, it, it, it took you know great risks to do their jobs. Um, but too often, elements of our overall civilian surge, both in terms of personnel and money, were misapplied. Too many, too many people wound up stuck on the embassy compound in Kabul, doing uh, you know rote tasks that could have easily been done here, as opposed to getting out. Um, into uh, the provinces, into the districts. Um, we didn't scour the country as effectively as we should have to find uh, the right people to go. Instead, we relied on resumes coming in over the transom, uh, contractors who had served with you know, moderate distinction or less than moderate distinction in Iraq or retirees, or um, as opposed to, to looking out for, for people with, with the appropriate skill sets. Uh, and on the aid front, uh, you know, there was there was this rush to spend money. There was a this rush to to to, to amp up the burn rate to as large as it could get. You know, when it got to three hundred million dollars a month, uh, everyone felt very very proud of themselves on the aid compound in Kabul. Um, you know, it, it was far exceeding the absorptive capacity of the country. Um, and it, there were, and then there were sort of you know stupid things that I chronicle in the book. You know, did we have to have a pig roast on the embassy compound in 2010 in the middle of a Muslim country? Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, a Mardi Gras party where you know there was sort of public urination in the embassy compound. I mean, these were these were things that should have been on the basic what not to do list after the you know shenanigans of the coalition provisional authority in Baghdad in 03 and 04. And yet they they, they sort of resurface there. And, and, it, and it contributed, Mark, I think, to, to real civ mill tensions where you had, you had this crowd at the embassy doing its thing, um, not getting out to the district soon enough or uh, you know, engaging in, in some of the sort of Washington bureaucracy transplanted to Kabul. And you had a military, uh, on the other side of the road, the military command that was trying to move as fast as it could. It had people out in these places. And, and so the the hope of getting everybody, you know, marching in, on the same beat and, and same team, I think, it, it caused it caused a degree of tension that um, could have been avoided. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, my name is Kitty, and I'm from the Green Party of Sweden. Um, I would actually like to spin a bit on that question and think about um, how do you think the U.S. military strategy has changed since the situations in Iraq and in Afghanistan? I was thinking especially in regards to um, the um, operation in Libya and what do you think for about the future U.S. stand in Syria? Thank you. Um, but the, the Syria situation is still very fluid, but I think Libya is one where you know you you see the um, you see the impact of these large land wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and and very little desire to to replicate large footprint um, uh, operations. I think Gates was kind of blunt about yes. It. <laughs> yes. Anybody who wants to engage in another you know land war in Asia should what have their head examined, right? Yes, right. Yeah, the president should have his head examined. I think is what he said. Maybe I'm misquoting him, but yes. That was Something that was a great that, uh, that was a great speech. But you know, there's there's truth to that. I mean, uh, these things are costly uh, in terms of in terms of human lives and in terms of in terms of dollars that we as a country don't have. Um, and and 
In some cases, the, the big footprint um, model, there are real questions about efficacy. I mean, you send in a conventional battalion into an Afghan district, you're creating additional economies of violence. Taliban financiers are coming in and paying disaffected young men to lay bombs and to snipe at patrols. This, you know, people who, who would not get paid to do that stuff if, if there weren't coalition forces there. Um, you know, the, 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 that presence uh, involves huge disruptions to the economy. I mean, as, as we, we do the drawdown, there, there are big questions about ongoing security in Afghanistan, but also of this potential economic crash as, as aid budgets shrink, as, 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 as Afghans who are employed as, you know, translators and other administrative staffers for both military forces and, and non-military forces are, are, are furloughed. Um, so it, it, these things cause a huge disruption. And so let me ask you just that Afghan perspective. In this uh, strategy in Helmand and Kandahar when you were there and to the extent that you could sample authentic yep. opinion, obviously Afghan society is quite diverse and there's a lot of rent seeking going on in the, in the economy you just described. But can you say anything about what Afghan, what the most important Afghan perspectives about this surge were as you encountered them in the South? Well, you know, the, the irony is that you know, from afar, right, you see the images of, of Afghans protesting or, you know, see the impact of, 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 of roadside bombs and you say, well, don't they all sort of hate us and they all want us to go home? And the irony is in, in many cases in these, in these remote areas, particularly in the rural areas, they actually like the presence of coalition forces. I mean, they look at the Taliban and say, those guys are a bunch of zealots, we don't want to live under them. They look at their government and say, those guys are um, you know, thieves and they're corrupt and they abuse us. And they look at coalition forces and say, well, they're here, they're protecting this area, there's sort of largesse coming from them, they're, they're, they're uh, pumping money into reconstruction projects, and if you know, my child is really sick, I can take him to the gate of the base. And so they look at it and say, these guys are, are you know, they're not so bad, they're, they're actually worried in places in the South as, as uh, US forces pack up to go. But, while we're there in those numbers, it means that there's no incentive for the, for the Afghan forces to really step up and, and do what they need to do. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure it's in the book or not, but you know, I was in Nawa, one of these districts in, in central Helmand where the Marines went into in 09, and it was, it was flooded with money by USAID. At one point, more money was going in there. Uh, uh, the, the amount of money was greater than the per capita income for every man, woman, and child in the district, a huge distortion. Um, and a, a school principal went to the, the provincial education department because he hadn't gotten his allotment of notebooks and he said, you know, I'd like, you know, the books. And I uh, was told, I asked where he was from. He said, I'm from this part of Nawa. I said, oh, you're from Nawa. Go ask the Marines. They're taking care of you. Um, and so it, it, it creates this, um, it creates a lack of incentive for the Afghans to step up. Stay on this side for a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, Jeff Dressler from ISW. Rajiv, how you doing? Um, Question for you, one of the, the narratives that you often hear about the decision to go into Helmand uh, is that it was designed or essentially uh, the decision was made to, to bail out the Brits uh, who had bitten off more than they could chew. Um, in the course of your research for the book and your interviews, uh, how much did you find uh, behind that? It's a very good question and, and Jeff there with the Institute for Study of War has done some of the best research in the think tank world on, on Helmand. Um, I think it was a big factor. Uh, first off, you had the Canadians that, that didn't really um, want to cede more parts of, the, of, of, of central Kandahar. Uh, they were already giving up Argandab. They, they had lost a lot of troops there, and so they were somewhat reluctant. The British were concerned about Helmand turning into sort of Basra Chapter 2. They wanted a narrative of, of, of progress and success there. So they were, they were eager for U.S. forces to come, uh, certainly help backfill them in the central part of Helmand, uh, eventually moving into some of the more challenging northern parts of the province, if it could be portrayed as sort of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a joint coalition operation as opposed to an American takeover. 
Um, but once, as soon as the Marines arrived, all of a sudden there were more U.S. boots on the ground than British ones, and so you had some tensions that, that, that stemmed from all of that. But um, you know, I think that if, if you look at all the reasons why the, the U.S. forces went into Helmand, that one is perhaps the most defensible reason. Uh, we were helping out our closest ally in the world, um, and, and, and they, they needed to be bailed out. Uh, Cale Weston, a big character in the book, who was Larry Nicholson's Paul ad, kept reminding me of this fact that, you know, the, we, we have a special relationship with the Brits. They needed uh, U.S. assistance there, and, and, and that was a, a key reason to, to go in and to, to, to help them out in, in, in areas. But I, I think that could have been done with a limited number of troops, not, not by then eventually growing the U.S. footprint to, to 20,000 troops or a fifth of all coalition forces, of all, pardon me, a fifth of all U.S. forces in a province with 4% of the country's population. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Ahmad John Ali and I'm an intern with the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Uh, my question is directed to Mr. Rajiv and um, Looking at the long-term U.S. strategic interest in Afghanistan, we may agree that uh, it is not just about Afghanistan, but it's about the broader region because of the strategic location of Afghanistan. Uh, given that, uh, also on the ground, I think most of the Afghan civilians are extremely concerned that the U.S. is pulling out of Afghanistan in 2014, there is nervous among the population of, in terms of what's going on and why are they living? Is the Taliban going to take over? What role do you think the United States should play beyond 2014 in Afghanistan? It's a very good question. Um, and, and, and the U.S. role post-2014 is, 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 is still undefined. Um, the U.S. military would like to have a continued presence there, uh, both for training Afghan forces as well as conducting counterterrorism operations in the region. Um, obviously, a, a desire of the State Department for robust diplomatic presence. Uh, there'll be, Afghanistan will continue to need a, a large volume of international financial assistance, so you could see USAID there. And then the very large um, uh, training mission, the Afghan army, will continue to need somewhere in the order of $4 billion to be sustained. The question is, as, as troops reduce, What's, and, and financial pressures uh, increase at home, what's our willingness to, to help sustain that? Um, you know, I think back to the movie Charlie Wilson's War and that last scene where Charlie's fighting to get a million dollars for, for schools in Afghanistan and can't do it. And will, will we be you know, replicating that um, in a world where there are few US, few of any US forces there, yet Afghanistan still has key needs you know, it's not lost on uh, General Allen, who's the, the top commander there now, that when the Soviets pulled out, the Najibullah Bullah government did not immediately fall. You know this very I well, Steve. Visit him, yes. <laughs> right. It fell in 1992, when after the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, you know, Moscow couldn't, uh, couldn't send money to Kabul, and Najibullah Bullah didn't you know, all of a sudden, you know, the funds it ran lasted out. lasted six weeks after the money ran out. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, what's our, what's our staying power going to be in terms of, of funding an Afghan government that will continue from both there and here to, to, to appear very corrupt, it will be corrupt probably, and uh, Afghan security forces that will be of sort of uneven quality, but we hope will be uh, strong enough to, to hold the place together. Great. You go to the back, the gentleman there, um, Looks to be here uh, with a media organization. He's got headphones on. Uh, my name is Anshuman Apte. Uh, I'm with uh, Voice of America TV Ashna, that is Afghanistan service. Uh, my question to you is, sir, uh, you have mentioned uh, you know, the differences and how it, uh, they affected the reconciliation process uh, with Taliban. Uh, my question to you is, how do you think the differences at different levels of administration affected securing peace in Afghanistan before 2014? 
the, it's a good question to ask about this, the state of, of reconciliation. And you know, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be much happening. Uh, and uh, for a variety of factors, but you know, the Taliban see American troops streaming to the exits. Um, and you know, there isn't a whole lot of incentive right there to, right now to strike a deal. Um, you know, the, uh, the Pakistani government, which continues to provide some degree of sanctuary to, to key uh, insurgent leaders, um, doesn't necessarily see uh, a wholly peaceful Afghanistan in its interest. Um, I think that if, if left to its own devices, Afghanistan would probably forge a closer relationship with India than Pakistan, and that's of great concern in Islamabad and Rawalpindi. Um, but I think we had a moment. I'm not, in, in arguing that we squandered uh, a key year in trying to pursue negotiations, I'm not saying that negotiations were, were there uh, sitting on, you know, it wasn't a peace deal on the table waiting to be signed. It was always going to be a very thorny, complicated path to get there. But it, when it you just, say arguing that we squandered a year, you mean the year before <laughs> reconciliation talks were pursued in the conditions setting year of the surge? Or, or do you mean the year in which they were actually attempted and in, failed? In, in sort of the condition setting uh -huh. year that, that we could have moved with sort of greater alacrity. Right. You know, it, it, we're, it, it, it's basic logic, right, that your, your position on, on negotiation is, is greatest when you're, you know, when you're surging in forces, not when you're pulling out troops. Um, now, some have argued that we, we sort of undercut any chance of that by, by putting the deadline on. And that's probably a, a, a good case to be made for that. Um, and that you mean the 2014 exit? Or, or uh, no, the, the, the 2011 right. start of the drawdown right. that you know, hey, we're actually going to the exit doors. Right. And that if, you, if you're really serious about trying to pursue a, a negotiated strategy, perhaps not surging in as large of numbers, but, but doing something that was a, a longer term strategy. Uh, you know, go long as opposed to go big, which demonstrates a degree of staying power that then provides a, an incentive to the other side to say, all right, well, if this is going to be the, uh, the state of play, then maybe it, it behooves me to, to at least open some discussions. Uh, in the back there, and then we'll come forward. Hi, my name is Tom McEwen, and among many hats I wear, I'm an Army Reserve Civil Affairs Officer with more than my fair share of time in, uh, in Afghanistan. And the, the thing that struck me the most in reading the excerpt yesterday was the disagreement over reconciliation. Um, and I remember back in 2004, the DDR program, the Demobilization, Disarmament, and Reintegration, was aimed primarily at the, uh, at the militias, but also was accepting low-level Taliban who wished to, to reconcile with the government as well. And I wonder if you could talk more about where the disconnect happened between then and now and, and why there was such a reluctance to, uh, to allow a reconciliation. So there were, in, in, in the first few years of, of this administration, there were two broad disconnects on reconciliation. There was, as, as I largely spelled out in yesterday's Washington Post expert, excerpt, pardon me, a, a disagreement uh, that, that really centered around personalities. Uh, who, would, who would take charge of this? And was it going to be Richard Holbrook or was it going to be somebody else? And the fighting between state and the White House over this. So, but, 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 but it's worth noting that, that those parties that were fighting were largely in agreement about the need to pursue reconciliation. It was just a fight over who was going to lead it and how it was going to get done. The second point of tension was, was more civ mill, where you had a, a difference of views between civilians in our government and, um, and, and, and military leaders, um, most strikingly between General Petraeus and, um, and Holbrook and, 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 and uh, officials at the White House. Um, General McChrystal, toward the end of his time in Kabul, was actually uh, warming to the prospect of, of reconciliation, understanding that an outright military victory really wasn't going to be in the cards in Afghanistan. But when Petraeus arrived, um, he was less interested in, in uh, sort of continuing um, some of those nascent efforts that had been started by a, um, uh, a very astute colonel working for McChrystal um, and th thought that the approach to take was to, to really get more momentum on the battlefield and, and compel the Taliban or elements thereof 
to, to surrender, uh, to, to, to participate in, in, in the, the more modern versions of, of the, the, the DDR program um, and, and get them to essentially renounce the Taliban and reintegrate in, in sort of small cells uh, uh, in, in various parts of the country, um, but not yet the time being ripe to pursue a big peace deal. And because the civilians were so consumed with fighting one another, um, the, the broader disagreement with the military never really was, 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 was broached. Um, and so we, we again had a fragmented policy with regard to what, what was seen by many as being uh, you know, one way to, if not end the war as a whole, I think the prospect of a grand deal was uh, perhaps uh, uh, out of the question, but at least with, with ele cleaving off large elements of what, the what Taliban. Was the, what was the best way to reduce violence? And it seemed that General Petraeus, when he succeeded General McChrystal, arrived with an extrapolated view of the virtue of bottom-up, unit-by-unit reintegration models that he had overseen in Iraq. Uh, very, very much convinced that those, that was the right place to start in Afghanistan. You have this wonderful scene, I think it's after he takes command, where Holbrook is in the car with him, and he says, General, I want to talk to you about reconciliation. And Petraeus says, that'll take 15 seconds. Not now. That's right. Uh, maybe later, in effect. Um, okay, uh, you've been waiting for a good while. Yeah. Uh, Kami, but with the Pakistani spectator, and my question is about Pakistani Balochistan. Pakistani Balochistan is on fire, and Pakistani general believed that it's because of our presence in Afghanistan. So this means that the Pakistani government doesn't have very aggressive design on Afghanistan. Whatever they are doing, they are doing out of insecurity, that somehow their country would fall apart if we stay there for long term. And my other point is, I mean, I want to ask you if it's Pakistani insecurity is justifiable. And my second question is very related that you said that still some Afghani look at Taliban to provide them security, peace, and quick justice with less corruption. Doesn't that justify Pakistani position that Afghanis are very xenophobic, we should leave them alone, and they can take care of their problem better, even though we are spending billions of dollars, and still they look at Taliban for some kind of salvation? Thanks. Um, look, I, I think the fact that Afghan people in some, some places look at, at the Talibs as a, um, as a better alternative to their government uh, shouldn't leave us feeling or leave the Afghan people feeling you know, satisfied with that sort of status quo. Um, if anything, that's, that's a real charge to, the, to the, the Kabul government that it needs to get its act in gear and needs and, 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 I, and I, I do think that that requires a degree of international assistance. It's not just leave the country alone. Um, but you know, the question is what kind of assistance and, and does that need to be more civilian assistance than, than military assistance or what's the mix? And, and is, it, is it to, um, to try to create uh, you know, elaborate district level governments or is it, is it some other model therein, but. And there's, and, the, and there's also this uh, kind of larger question embedded in his that plays off the observation you made about economies of violence that can be created uh, through the arrival of very well resourced American res uh, military forces. In a regional sense, the Pakistanis argue we've created an economy of violence on their side of the border by arriving in such provocative, visible, and um, um, you know, forceful numbers, and that a better way to secure Pakistan's stability over the long run would be to stop conducting our military operations in Afghanistan in such a way as to create this regional economy of violence. Do you buy that? Well, you know, I, I, I hear that argument all the time. I, I think. Um, you know, look, there's, there, there is some truth to that, and had, had the policy been PAC-AF as opposed to AF-PAC, and had we looked at the set of interventions in Afghanistan that were most likely to improve uh, stability in Pakistan, would a large conventional surge been at the top of that list? And I don't think so. Doug, unless your name is also Doug, I'll come to you after that. 
Thank you. Hi, Rajiv. Uh, Marlon Hardinger for the U.S. State Department. You've touched on governance and the challenges in uh, particularly Hellman. Uh, there were some notable successes in Hellman. You had a very effective uh, provincial governor, some very good district governors, but uh, the civilians and the military struggled to connect those together and then link resources from the central government to the provincial and the district level. I was wondering if you could comment on that and any of the challenges you saw on that. So Hellman, Hellman was really, in some ways, what, what everybody looked at as, as, as a model for what, we, you know, if only you could take the provincial governor, Governor Mongol, and you know, replicate him. I, have, I, I, I start out one chapter sort of describing Mongol. He's a, he's a very unique figure. Um, but the question really is, is, is Mongol in some ways you know, uh, an, an ephemeral part of, 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 the, of the Afghan landscape, uh, a guy who is, um, you know, relies upon British forces and Americans for security, for, for, to pay the budgets uh, of his office, um, yeah, helicopters to fly about the province, and um, you know, is, is he the sort of guy that, who could survive? Um, and, 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 and the system of government that he's running there, uh, could, that, could that continue in the absence of uh, large numbers of, of foreign forces and, and foreign dollars? And um, you know, I, I, I tell the story of, of, of the transformation of Hellman. You know, prior to that, um, Hellman had one of the worst governors, a, a poppy baron warlord who was very close to Karzai, um, who once he was uh, uh, removed from power, um, you know, boasted that he sent many of his men to go off and fight for the Taliban. Um, you know, that wasn't the model. Uh, but are we, you know, have we swung from one extreme to the other? And have we been trying to build something there in terms of governance that, that won't sustain? Uh, you know, Marlon is going back. Marlon was there for three years working in Lashkar Gah. Was spent a year here studying Pashto. Is now heading back to Helmand. Uh, you know, one of the rare civilians who's who's put in um, you know a, a real real good chunk of his life in, in Afghanistan. Um, you're gonna you're gonna be trying to build something there that will hold. And, and I think there's, there's a real que question as, uh, with Afghan politics, um, with the future of, of, of uh, coalition involvement there, how much of that will, will we be able to, will, will stick? Time for one last question, and I'm gonna give the home team advantage to my colleague, Doug Ollivant. Hi, uh, Doug Ollivant with New America Foundation. <clears throat> Rajiv, let's say all these things you document in your book don't happen. You know, the White House and the State Department decide to all pull together in the same direction. ISAF and Embassy Kabul get in bed together. Um, the State Department gets the right people. They actually send three quarters of them out to the field, and the RSOs actually agree to let them work. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the Marines, you know, decide to be team players with DOD and go where the ground commander needs them to go. Um, does this change the, the end story for a country that's fighting it out with Chad and Somalia for the bottom of the Human Development Index? I'd like to think that if our government, Civ and Mill, approached this differently, that the resources that we put in would have led to uh, a greater degree of change that would have ultimately translated into better lives for the Afghan people. They probably would still be among the poorest nations in the world with all sorts of problems, still be an insurgency, but would it be marginally better or, or something more than marginally better? I suppose we'll never know, um, but um, it, it stands to reason that if we had, had played those cards differently, uh, we would have gotten uh, a greater, uh, greater output from all that we had committed to this. And you know, ultimately for me, it, you know, it, it's more than about dollars. It comes down to, to lives and for the lives of all the service members and the, the civilians out there and the Afghans. Um, those, those have to be worth something. And um, I, I believe that, that those sacrifices all have been worth something, but could they be worth something more? Um, and I know it's a, it's a uh, it's a difficult subject to address, but um, I, I come away from this feeling like um, we, uh, we, 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 could have, we could have accomplished a lot more as a nation over there 
um, and um, for, for all, the, all the people that, that we had sent out there, civilian and military, who, who, who did, in many cases, you know, great, brave work. Um, but how do you, how do you make, get, the, get the maximum impact out of it? And to me, that's, that's part of the tragedy of all of this. And you know, I went there hoping for a different outcome. I didn't go there wanting to write this book, going back to the beginning. Um, but I did because I felt I had to. I felt that this was a story that, that we all needed to know. So hopefully we don't duplicate this yet again. Uh, just in closing, you know, thank you, Steve. I, I really appreciate sure. you taking the time to, my, my to, to, to be here today, uh, but also to, to, to CNAS, uh, to, to Nate, to John, to, to Richard, and uh, the whole crew over there. Um, uh, it, it's a remarkable institution. It gave me a home for a couple of months to work on this book, uh, key months as I pulled it all together. Um, but uh, it does, uh, in my view, the, the, the smartest thinking, the smartest research and writing on national security affairs in, in this town and in an incredibly collegial, nonpartisan way. Uh, there's a reason why uh, so many journalists uh, like myself, uh, people from the Washington Post, the New York Times, um, and, and other organizations uh, work on books at, at CNAS because it's, it's the sort of place that you can, you can work on these projects with, with real credibility. Uh, so I'm, I'm just deeply grateful for, for, for the support that they've shown me and for the, for the work that they continue to do on, on these important issues. If they don't give you another fellowship after that, then they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, so, uh, look. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'd like to just uh, close very briefly by also commending Nate and John for supporting this work and for the extraordinary work they do. I think, Rajiv, congratulations. You've shown us all again why journalism of this depth and uh, persistence really matters. The tenor of these questions and the debate, the open-endedness of them, their relevance to American national security policy going forward reminds us that you can't uh, invent this kind of journalism on the fly. It requires time and resources, 15 trips over two years, the Washington Post, CNAS, the Wilson Center, all of those institutions that supported your endeavor plus your own professional desire to go out and do this work. Uh, for any of you in the room who, who live in institutions that can make this journalism uh, possible in the years ahead, I think you've reminded us again why it matters. And uh, I thank all of you for being here today. The bar is open. And please give Rajiv one last uh, round of congratulations. Thanks, Steve.